I want to talk a little bit about an, um, an interview or a discussion that took place on Barry Weiss's podcast, Honestly, with a woman named Helen Lewis. And the problem is that, sh that the two of them uh, specifically take me to task, and we will come back to the meaning of that. But I'm not interested in talking about this because they take me to task though it does mean that I am expert on some of the things they say and I am in a position to comment on the veracity or lack thereof of those things. Barry had Helen Lewis on her podcast earlier, I think it was last Friday. She and Michael Schellenberger and Renee Duresta were on Sam Harris's podcast. And Barry says something in both cases, almost identically, hmm. which I believe is a reference you know, so in some sense, in, in Barry's own podcast, she tries to uninvent the IDW, and she basically imagines it as her creation. You know, maybe she made uh, her article, uh, created something that didn't really exist, wasn't, wasn't for real in the first place, which is kind of a nonsense uh, idea. But in talking about the IDW, she lays out a trajectory where she says, you know, I think people who you know, got something right and noticed that something wasn't being well stated by the official institutions, then fell down the rabbit hole and they went from, you know, the CDC was wrong on masks or whatever her example is, uh, to, and then her example is that Bill Gates is trying to inject you with a microchip uh, in your brain because of the Great Reset. This angered me to hear it because, yeah. A, I it's like think... a prototypical st straw man. It's a prototypical straw man because mm -hmm. it starts out right. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it doesn't even end entirely wrong. Is the Great Reset a problem? Yeah, I think it probably is. Is Bill Gates involved? Yeah, I don't exactly understand why. But, you know, there's something there. Does this have anything to do with microchips in the brain? No, that was... You throwing something in there to toxify the well so that nobody would start to try to sort out what the relationship of these things is. So anyway, um, what and, I want to do... Most such maneuvers are unwitting, I think. I, I, one, I'm not saying that that one was, but um, take pieces that might be plausible and add to them pieces that sound so absurd that by tying them together, you make... you you you. You cause people who haven't yet started to investigate such a thing be like, oh, there's too many things to do in the world, not that one. Not that one, that's toxic. Well, I don't know if it's witting or unwitting, but this definitely feels strategic, which I do not, um, I do not begrudge Barry uh, a strategic nature. Obviously, strategy is important in order to get good things accomplished. Mm -hmm. But what she's accomplishing in this case um, I don't believe is legitimate. And the there are several features here that tell me something is off. So Barry and Helen are having this discussion, and they are talking about what the IDW is. And Barry describes the IDW. Um, and she basically names a number of the male participants who were in her article and says, and there were some females as well you are again disappeared. And that will become relevant when we get to the part where I come in for critique. I think your disappearance has a meaning. This is not the first time we've seen it. Sam does it, and Barry is now doing it. But let me... Let me I, mean, I, I think there's one of three, three things going on there. Well, let me put my hypothesis on the table. You tell okay. me if it's in your list. Yeah. The podcast that Barry does, where I'm claiming that she is involved in this middle ground scramble to create an ex explanation for how she and others missed the boat on COVID and uh, slap power on the wrist in a way that it will want, mm -hmm. um, is traffics in the uh, moniker gurus, mm -hmm. right? Helen has taken up the idea of gurus in earnest, and I am effectively portrayed as one. I think... Look, the fact is, during COVID, as you and I were doing what we did, we played different roles. You know, I've always been um, more theoretical in my work. Mm -hmm. So the roles are asymmetrical. But 
there was no asymmetry in the level of contribution. In fact, one of the things that comes up in the little clip that I'm going to play is a contribution that you made. The response to something Helen says is something that I got from you. So my point would be, if you're going to... I don't yet know what we're talking about. In if case. you're going to level the allegation that um, podcast listeners are falling for gurus, mm -hmm. right? The point is, well, you and I don't look like a guru because a guru doesn't tend to look like two scientific people having a conversation about hypotheses, predictions, and tests, right? Mm -hmm. That's not a guru move. That's a science move, yeah. right? And for two people to use a singular pronoun, that's just tricky. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> indeed. In fact, I can't even figure out how you would do it. But, right. um, but the point is, if they are going to dismiss us mm -hmm. as not having been right because what we really did and you know barry's language is you know when she says you go from spotting that the cdc screwed up uh masks mm -hmm. to thinking bill gates is trying to inject you with microchips she describes it as falling down the rabbit hole yeah it doesn't sound good it's funny though a lot of the heterodox thinkers who are quite good use the metaphor rabbit hole for themselves, mm -hmm. right? The point is this is not inherently a bad thing. And in fact, a rabbit hole isn't a rabbit hole. A rabbit hole is a rabbit warren. Right. And so in going down a rabbit hole, built into the metaphor is the idea that there will be blind alleys, right? Mm -hmm. Going down the rabbit hole is about sorting what is down. But also unexpected ways out. Yeah, multiple, multiple ways in, right? So mm -hmm. anyway, um, maybe we should play the clip and uh, then we can talk about what it's implicated. It's short. Um, so, yeah, Zach. Are you ready? Yeah, we are ready. Gave them so much to kick against. And the more that people said, you know, these people are awful, you shouldn't listen to them, you shouldn't see them, you shouldn't, rather than rebutting them. I, the more power they got. Right. And I felt very strongly when I went into that Jordan Peterson interview. I, this is the one bit I do remember having a conversation with myself about. I will never say in that interview, I'm never going to say anything that you say is offensive. I'm going to say well, if I think it's wrong and I'm going to make the argument about why it's wrong. And I think that's the thing is that there was the overused cudgel of offense and blasphemy rather than as you say, you can say to Brett Weinstein, well, look, there's very good evidence that the vaccines are safe and effective and that ivermectin was a promising treatment at one point, but we now have a good meta-analysis review that says, sorry, no, it's not. And it's not a big pharma conspiracy because it's a generic drug that's very cheap. Like, you know, this isn't <laughs> like, it would have been, you know, lots of things that were, you know, like basic steroids. Dexamethasone, for example, was in exactly the same position ivermectin was, but that one turned out to work. And so people prescribed that one. Like, what's your mechanism where you, why you think this was suppressed? And that's the argument that you should be making, right? Rather than you must not question the wisdom of the elders. You have to partake in Okay, um, so Helen in this clip is portraying me as somebody who can't grok even basic information about COVID. And she says, you know, you can tell Brett Weinstein that there is, you know, evidence that the vaccines are safe and effective. The implication being, I simply am unaware of that evidence or worse, that the evidence exists and uh, that I refuse to accept it for some reason. Now, the fact is, there is an awful lot of evidence, there is mounting evidence that the vaccines are unsafe. It does not mean that nobody gets away with being injected. Presumably most people do. But the idea that she is simply going to slip in there the assumption that the evidence tells us that these things are safe and effective is preposterous. Yep. Now, I will point out, Barry says nothing. Barry, a journalist who knows that there is mounting evidence of the hazard of these vaccines, has an obligation journalistically to challenge that. It is not simply true that they are safe and effective. And I believe that Barry actually has in her circle somebody who's been vaccine injured. So she knows better. Yep. Um, and she had an obligation to say so. What's more, she's talking about the IDW. And there are a number of people in the IDW or close to it who also know of vaccine injuries. So, you know, there's a vaccine injured person uh, in that realm. There's somebody with a spouse. The fact is, this is not a realm in which a journalist can bypass the fact that there is evidence around us of something more than safe and effective. But then worse, she goes on 
to say that, um, you know, another thing that you can't seem to convey to me because apparently I'm too dumb to get it is that ivermectin seemed promising, but then she says, but we now have a compelling meta-analysis that tells us that that is not the case. Really. I think Helen Lewis does not understand what the state of the evidence is on ivermectin. I think she's barely familiar with it and that her use of the term meta-analysis tells us that. I think she's not referring to a meta-analysis because if she is, she's either referring to the Cochrane meta-analysis, which said ivermectin didn't work, the Cochrane meta-analysis, which is compromised by the fact that they set inclusion criteria for which studies would be uh, represented and then violated their own criteria. And if she's not talking about that one, she's talking about the Andy Hill meta-analysis. The Andy Hill meta-analysis, which Andy Hill on videotape captured by Tess Lorry admits he changed the conclusion based on his funder's preference. Right. So and you she's have certainly not talking about the Lorry analysis meta analysis because Ooh. that one um, shows up in the opposite direction. Right. So yep. a what she's done is just if she is talking about the meta analyses, she's either misrepresenting them or uh, remaining ignorant of the actual underlying problem with these things, or she doesn't mean meta analysis all, and she's throwing that in there to sound technical. Well, and I think... And then she's referring to, uh, for example, the TOGETHER trial or the ACTIVE-6 trial, where we also have evidence of fraud, where, for example, the um, dosing carries this unexplained parameter where people above a certain BMI have their dose capped. And when you have a disease that afflicts people in proportion to the degree of their obesity, and you start underdosing people the fatter they are, of course you cause a problem. So the fact is, she is representing this as Brett Weinstein simply cannot understand the state of the evidence on ivermectin, when in fact, she doesn't apparently understand the state of the evidence herself. Well, and so I don't, I, I'm not that interested in talking about um, why I'm not present in many of these, uh, in many of these attempted takedowns of you. Um, but I said that I think that there's three different reasons. And I do think that those three different reasons are useful to consider um, across the board with regard to this. But just let's remember that the, the reason this is important is that this cannot happen again. And that this middle ground scramble as you have described it, in which the institutions that are flawed and failing are trying to keep some of their imprimatur of seriousness and are effectively signing on with, or the other pseudo-heterodox sort of talking heads are signing on with the idea of what the institutions have always been doing without understanding anything about what has actually happened. And so you're just going to get, it's like the, the, the metaphor that I was thinking of is like, it's, it's like rearranging deck chairs on the analysis, except for rearranging intellectuals. Like, it's just like, you've got, you're going to replace some of the old talking heads with some new talking heads, and they seemed heterodox at some point, but it turns out they're not courageous. These are not the courageous people. They're just following along like everyone else, looking for power. And no, not everything is about power, but these moves are. So, um, you know, why, why don't I show up when Sam Harris talks and Scott Adams and, you know, and Helen Lewis and Barry Weiss and such? I think it's one of three reasons, and it's some combination often. One, because people aren't actually paying attention. They've never heard you and me talk. They've, they've never heard you talk. Um, they haven't actually engaged the material. They've gotten their information from someone else. And that, I suspect, not knowing very much at all about the situation is what, for instance, Helen has done. She does, she's never heard anything here and you know but it's also true that you know you went on with robert malone and steve kirsch you went on with pierre Corey, like you do the the guest hosting and so you know you're more out there you're easier for the people who want to hate on you know what it is that we're doing and what you're doing to grab you and to take it and so um i think one of the big reasons is um it's a reveal of actually i never actually listened to or read anything that here they said and so i'm going to just focus there that's one second reason is that in some cases um not this particular, these these two women, presumably, although I don't know, is that it's actual cryptic misogyny. 
and that they're accustomed to not paying attention to women being influential in a space um, that sounds, you know, that sounds like things that they can't understand, and therefore probably this is not a thing that women would do. Uh, well, so that's obnoxious and terrible if it's true, and yeah, but I do think that that is um, that is part of the reason sometimes. And the third reason. Uh, I think that this happens, and I do think that this is part of what's going on with the um, podcast you're talking about now, is that it's strategic, and it's more difficult to take down the two of us together. Because as you say, uh, we don't look like a guru, right? Uh, we look like two people with scientific backgrounds, and yes, also credentials, but that's not the thing that matters here. We have decades both individually and even more decades between us, thinking carefully through scientific um, <clears throat> patterns and processes, making observations in the world, figuring out what hypotheses might explain them, how to test between, how to discriminate between those hypotheses, and how to move forward. That is what we do professionally, both of us. And yes, I'm more of an empiricist back when we were actively practicing scientists in the way that most people think of when they think of it, and you were more of a theorist. Uh, but, you know, I do theory, you do empiricism, like we, we both do both things. And it's just far easier to have it be, especially in this era, this like this, even the people who claim to be the most anti-woke, like, oh, let's go after the dude. He's, you know, it's, it's just, it's this guy who's just off, off the cuff. He's just not making any sense. You just can't talk to him. You can't talk to him about ivermectin. Really? Like, I'm, I'm guessing that this is what you were talking about when you said that one of the things that they talk about is something that I brought nope, to the table. I haven't okay. gotten there yet. Okay. Well, like, I remember, I remember having gotten up one early, one Saturday back almost two years ago, probably maybe two years ago. And we were still living in Portland, and I don't remember how I went there, but I went down that rabbit warren of ivermectin and emergency use authorizations, and you came downstairs, and I looked at you, my jaw dropped. It's like, I think I have stumbled upon the most egregious example yet mm -hmm. of anything in the pandemic to date that, that I or we have talked about, and it was ivermectin. So that's the piece. Yeah. Um, it is specifically the emergency use authorization, because the last thing that Helen says in the clip that we played is that it doesn't even make sense that there would be uh, some sort of collusion to exclude ivermectin as a treatment for COVID because it's a generic drug and it's cheap. Okay, Helen, that's a non sequitur, right? The reason that people imagine that ivermectin was blocked was because it was a direct competitor to these vaccines, which were emergency use authorized. And emergency use authorization requires that there not be a viable treatment in order to be granted. Yeah, there being a direct com there being a direct competitor uh, to the vaccine to to the vaccines to uh, prevent COVID precludes. The EUA and therefore would have precluded uh, the vaccines going on the market when they did. Right, and then she says that um, this her point is proven because uh, she names a um, steroid that uh, is like used. Like dextromorph something. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to skip it for the second. But the point is the fact that some other generic drug is being used, and yes, it is used for pulmonary. Uh, compromise that comes along with COVID. Is it dextromethorphan? No, 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 no. It's not? Okay. Um, anyway, the, no, 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 the no, fact that she not. uses, <laughs> the fact that she uses this example is uh, evidence that she doesn't understand what's going on because the point is ivermectin has two values. It does treat people with COVID effectively, assuming you treat them early with a sufficient dose. This has been demonstrated many times, and we can talk about why you think the evidence says that it doesn't, but that evidence is not persuasive. But the other thing it does is it is uh, a preventative of contracting COVID. And so the point is, these, you are comparing uh, apples to spaceships. They're, <laughs> they're not comparable. And, um, you know, I'm now thrown by Zach, who says that we didn't play as much of the clip oh, as I sure. as I uh, thought that we played. But nonetheless, there's like four or five sentences involved in her critique, and there's three or four critical errors in what she says. Now, my point is going to be 
she's not actually trying to make an analytical point. She's trying to sound like she's making an analytical point. The actual payload of this entire exploration mm -hmm. is the word guru. The idea is, it, this is not going to compel anybody who actually pays attention to the podcast. What this is going to do is prevent other people from paying attention. That's its purpose, is to stigmatize us, to make us sound like, and, and this is a move that we see repeatedly now. The idea is, if that thing persuades you, that's because you're a sucker. And so the point is, anybody who hears us and thinks, oh, well, that's not what I thought it was. That actually sounds kind of compelling. That sounds like a scientific discussion. That sounds like a discussion I'd like to pay attention to. Ah, you're a sucker. You're falling for a guru. It's, you know, something is fitting a religion-shaped hole in your persona, mm -hmm. and that's why you're responding to it. So this is designed, it's like, you know, it's like skunk stink. It's supposed to make it difficult for people to get anywhere near this discussion, mm -hmm. because really the point is another discussion has to take place, and it's not up to the challenge. Yeah, well, I will, I will repeat that, um, I mean, also not on my list of people we've been hearing from who are... Um, grateful for the conversations in which we um, try to logic through evidence out loud in front of the camera uh, are uh, many tradesmen right we got roofers and and you know all all sorts of people who are again doing physical things in the world uh, I would hope that anyone who is so convinced that what uh, we're doing is based on a simple rubric of contrarianism or um, falling prey to some kind of something, something, something. Uh, I, I would propose first that, you know, that's, you're recognizing a part of your own brain and that part is not necessarily universal. And that if you get yourself in the habit of doing something physical in the world and seeing the manifestations of it, then you will um, be more able in the future to distinguish between arguments that are careful and logical and arguments which are entirely based in social conclusions. And I think most of what we're hearing, um, most of what you're talking about here, are arguments based entirely in the social sphere with sort of nodding, passing uh, referral to uh, sciencey things but this is coming from people who aren't actually engaging any of the evidence. Yeah, um, that's quite right. I would say that they've, there are multiple ways that they are attempting to dismiss the conversation that now needs to take place, and people should be um, aware of all of them, right? You've mentioned contrarianism, right? To the extent that the system got really essentially everything wrong about COVID, from its origin to the best mechanism for treating it, to the safety of the vaccines, all of these things, to the utility of vitamin D, all of these things it got wrong. And so if the system is in the practice of getting everything wrong, yes, a contrarian could get there without understanding anything, but that doesn't make people who understood contrarians by nature. Yeah, um, no, and I, and I think we talked about this last week, but I wrote, I wrote a piece in my subsec last year that I have been just been sending to people when they, you know, like, oh, you're just a contrarian. Like, no, that is the opposite of science. It is the opposite of science. It is the because, opposite of science. So is faith. Both of those things. Simply having an idea in advance of I will or I will, I will accept or I will reject whatever the authority says. That's not scientific. Um, in addition, I also uh, hear, especially from uh from various quadrants including um oh boy damn i've forgotten um <clears throat> the thing that barry says in this podcast is that and actually helen picks up on this and runs with it the idea is that all of this is explainable by audience capture right a term that Helen correctly attributes to Eric and then misdefines, right? Audience capture would be the idea that you simply start saying the things that the audience wants to hear because it's lucrative, right? And I want to point out that, yes, that's a very sophisticated sounding uh, rationale for dismissing 
uh, a correct line of logic. But what is really obvious and should be obvious to anybody who pays attention to this podcast is that we are very frequently um, arriving at a position for which there is exactly no audience, right? Mm. Like, for example, um, global warming is real, it's dangerous, but the models are crap. And the fields that study this are going to be compromised by the same perverse incentives that compromise COVID policy. The vaccines are obviously a hazard. So is COVID, right? The obvious thing, if you were going to follow some uh, path to some audience that wanted to hear something, is to follow it to some audience that actually exists. Like COVID's not serious and the vaccines are dangerous. Um, Right. But the point is, time and time again, I remember being asked by a conservative friend, maybe a year into the pandemic. Why is it that you're skeptical of vaccines and yet you think COVID is a real problem? And I mean, that was really the phrasing. And I'm I'm not going to say who it was. And I thought, what what do those two things have to do with one another? Those are two different. Those are those are really unrelated. And. If you are coming to your conclusions because of who your team has voted for, yeah. you're not doing science. So, you know, let's put it this way. You can just simply look at the various ways that, um, and I don't, I wish this weren't personal. I wish we were talking about somebody else's podcast because it would be a lot easier uh, to do this. But you can't get to where we are by contrarianism by reflexive contrarianism, because the point is uh, the place that we have arrived is not otherwise on the map, right? Um, You can't get there through luck because the track record is too many uh, things that were unlikely but turned out um, to be true. And you can't get there by uh, falling down a rabbit hole either because the point is the pattern would peter out. So none of these things... um, makes sense. It's not a coin flip. It's a scientific process. It is, uh, it shouldn't be true that it is possible to do this on a podcast and, um, you know, come up with uh, a superior model to whatever the CDC is playing with, but it is apparently possible. And that really is the discussion we should be having. It has nothing to do with gurus. And, um, you know, it's really, uh, it's quite disgusting for people who have not gotten COVID right to be challenging those who have gotten it right over time through a process which we have done in public so that other people will not pay attention, right? That is just, it's an unacceptable thing to do. And frankly, um, the amount of chutzpah involved in doing such a thing is pretty remarkable. I I must say, I'm a bit horrified um, to be hearing this from both Sam uh, and Barry, both of them know better. And, um, I, I really, I hope they find their way back to sanity.